The holes are, kind of, are about, you know, changes and loss and then also... journey called Sansa Granddaughter's Journey to Manzanar. We have art in the other building and then they show the holes and the cuttings. Of the, the pieces I cut out are actually part of the design of the kimono. Um, some people have felt like the cuttings were kind of a, a destruction and I've heard some people say I've been, I was shredding the kimono which really wasn't my intention. My intention was to have it be like a meditation. Yeah. Don't tell my father's story in the Japanese incarceration in 12 minutes. <laughs> right. Okay. As uh, she said, I'm Karen Korematsu. Uh, my father, in case some of you don't know, was Fred Korematsu, who had the landmark Supreme Court case regarding the Japanese American incarceration uh, of, of 1942. And uh, so, how many of you have already heard of Fred? Mm, I don't know, there's some of you that haven't. That's very interesting. Okay, that's, um, and, but I'm sure you've heard about the incarceration. So what I've done, I collaborated with the uh, Presidio Trust um, Education and, uh, and the Curators um, on this project. Uh, and before I forget, there is, oh, this is my father's pipe that I uh, donated for the exhibit. And also, he received um, not only uh, the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Clinton in 1998, but also he received the first California Senate Medal um, in, uh, in, in April um, of that same year. You know, when my father received these honors, it wasn't just for himself, it was for the Japanese American community um, and, uh, and everyone who had been incarcerated. Uh, you know, my father thought, I mean, it wasn't complicated. Uh, I found out about my father's Supreme Court case in high school. Uh, my friend, uh, Maya, uh, third generation, I grew up in, in the East Bay, and uh, she was assigned a, a, a book to read and give a book report, uh, an oral book report, and she gets them up in front of the class, and the book is called Concentration Camps USA. Think about it, interesting title. Concentration Camps USA. So I'm 16, this is US history class, and she goes on to talk about the Japanese American internment. That was a new word that we were using then. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I never had heard about this before. And then she goes on to, to, to describe these terrible conditions. You know, there was 10, uh, you know, main Japanese American incarceration camps. I mean, I didn't even realize then all the Department of Justice camps that were throughout the United States and Army uh, camps. Um, that, you know, the day after Pearl Harbor, uh, there was, you know, over, you know, uh, uh, 2,000 up to 5,000 uh, Japanese and Japanese Americans who were picked up by the, by the government and put into these camps. Uh, and, uh, and so then, and then she went on to say, but there was this one man who resisted the military orders and it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. <laughs> oh, that's my name. Yeah. And I have 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me and I'm shrugging my shoulders thinking that's some black sheep of the family <laughs> because she never said Fred. So uh, uh, after class, and I, I attended San Lorenzo High School, and back in those days, but across the East Bay there, there was, you know, there was, it was 2,500 students, there were six Asian Americans, uh, two African Americans, and the rest were Caucasians. I mean, you know, that was, that was it. And uh, so after class, I said to my friend Maya, well, what's this about? And then she says, well, this is about your dad. I said, no way. <laughs> Somebody would have told me. And of course, I go running home and confront my mother. And she says, yes, this is about your father. And then I get the standard answer, you know, well, you have to wait till he gets home to ask him. Um, and my father not only had, you know, housing discrimination, he had employment discrimination. And sometimes he worked two jobs. And he, you know, by the time he was home, it was 8 o'clock at night, which is a long time from 
three thirty in the afternoon, and I calmed down a little bit, and I told him what happened that day, and he simply said, "It happened a long time ago, and what he did, he thought was right, and the government was wrong." There, there was a you know, sometimes make issues really complicated, right? You know, you can't see the forest through the trees. And it was really as clear as that. Uh, and, and, the, and he was, you know, he was born in Oakland, California. He was an American citizen. Uh, he was a third son of four boys. You know, my grandparents came over from Japan. Immigrants, hello. Um, you know, not a dirty word. One that we should be really, you know, supporting and encouraging. Um, and you know, it's it's it, you know, the for some of you don't who don't know, really the Japanese American incarceration, a, a big backstory was economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, as we do in this country, when we want cheap labor, we go to other countries. You know, and and I mean, look what we did to the to kidnapping the Africans, and they became slaves. And the Chinese that ended up in the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, and the Japanese. So they went to the five prefectures or or counties of Japan that were highly heavily agriculture and recruited people like my grandfather come to America land of opportunity we'll, we'll help you you know <laughs> get land and you can uh, do well and uh, and so that was that was really what, what was happening then and look what we're doing now to you know the to, to, to Mexicans and, and Latins that come over and uh, that want to work in I mean who's going to work in the fields I mean they want to do this work so it, and then we treat them like criminals. Um, I mean, obviously, we have a lot of other issues that, that go along with it. It's not that simple. But, you know, we still very much in this country uh, really are not focused, you know, on, 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 on human beings. And this is, the, this is the crime, the separation of families at the border. Um, this is the kind of work that I do, you know, to, to try to bring this, um, th you know, these issues to, to the public to say, hey, we had, we, af when, um, after Pearl Harbor, uh, then there was something called, you know, the um, registration. There was the Japanese registration. Well, now they're talking about, you know, then they wanted the Muslim registration, right? So this is nothing new for this country. We, we keep making the same mistakes, and that's why I, I founded the Fred T. Korematsu Institute to, uh, to, to help with education. We, first, we started with K through 12. It's a national organization. I work with the National Council for Social Studies. Um, I speak at their conferences every year and that, that move around the country and, and we develop curriculum to get into the schools because, you know, I don't know about you, when you were growing up and there's many people that are, you know, older as well, that, you know, there, there wasn't any, anything in our textbooks. There wasn't the curriculum. There wasn't the lesson plans. And we, you know, of course in education, we I mean, we treat te teachers like they're second class citizens citizens to begin with because we don't pay them and we and then they have to buy their own materials so I was determined to make sure that teachers would have curriculum in their hands that they didn't have to buy themselves and to make it simple enough that they could use because you know now we have standards and everything is is teach to test and we have those other complicated issues as well so that was that was really what drove me my father gave me the charge to carry on with education five months before he passed away. He, you know, he, he, the reason he was honored was he crossed this country to educate everyone, to tell his story, to be sure that something like the Japanese American incarceration would not happen again. Stop repeating history. This is the campaign that now I am supporting and that we are pushing across this country. When you go over to um, to the Futures Building and, and see the exhibit, the, then they came for me. We, there was also a, a documentary, and I'm not sure if they're going to show it, uh, called And Then They Came For Us, that was created by Abby Ginsberg, that is an award-winning documentary. Um, and you know, and we're, we're, we're uh, showing that across this country to have panel discussions in different communities because we want to, to let you know the rest of this nation know that we need to stand up for what is right uh, and and that's what my father said so it's you know I'm glad that you're all here um, being part of, of this you know journey because 
you know, this, fortunately, this exhibit will be here until uh, June 2020. Uh, unfortunately, the Then They Came For Me exhibit will end about September the 1st. So do tell, tell your friends. We're trying to work on some type of also project that we can make it kind of a road exhibit as well. Uh, so that, you know, and to get it also into the schools because it's it's important that this generation learns the mistakes of the past so we don't keep repeating them. Mm -hmm. And of course we're just like, you know, we're on the edge here. We're just really on the edge. And so it's all up to us to, you know, when I when you leave here, you know, I, I'm not telling you about how to vote. That's not the point. The point is to register to vote, make sure other people vote, but to be a part of our democracy because we are whittling it down inch by inch and it's important that we all support it. We all have a responsibility. And even, you know, what I say is being an American is to support citizens and non-citizens. That's what being an American is about. So um, I want to leave it also for a little time for questions. So I'm just going to um, end it uh, uh, now for this. But if my father were here today, he would say to you, remember to stand up for what is right, protest, but not with violence. Otherwise, they won't listen to you. But don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. lied to the Supreme Court, had altered evidence, and destroyed evidence. Even J. Edgar Hoover, who I know some of you may re recognize that name, um, you know, of all people, even his report said, there is no evidence of any, any espionage or spying of Jap from the Japanese to Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Even the U.S. Navy, the Ringel Report, said exactly the same thing. So when those reports, those, those, that information was going to be put in the footnotes of the brief that was going to the Supreme Court, the military and the government uh, got wind of that, and they ordered all those briefs to the, that were printed already to be destroyed. Talk about destroying evidence and reprinted without the footnote. So that's what our government was, was doing. And you know what? Years from now, who knows what other kind of information we're going to be uncovering um, you know, that, that's currently happening now. We acknowledge their continued connection to this region and we offer our respect to all the Ohlone people past and present. We also express our gratitude to our ancestors and our loved ones who were incarcerated during World War II. We honor their memory and we want to make sure that they did not sacrifice in vain. We we stand here in solidarity against racism here and uh, against mass incarcerations and the injustices and deportation that is happening. And it's been a great place for people to really think about executive orders and their impact. So I'd like to um, introduce a program, Shared Footsteps, to connect our stories here in the Bay Area and also to connect artists. And I'd like to introduce you today to Maze Daiko. <laughs>
Jimmy McKenzie, Miranda and Keiko, Tina Blaine, we also call her Bean, I'm Keiko and Triangle, <laughs> Catherine Kamenak, and I'm Janet Koike, so thank you for being here. We initially started with our um, Sansei granddaughter journey, and they will be showing their film at 1 o'clock and at 2 o'clock for the two shows. In April 2018, a journey began for five San Francisco Bay Area artists. Reiko Fuji, Ellen Bepp, Kathy Fujioka, Judy Shintani, and Sherry Arai DeBoer shared a common history. Their relatives were unjustly imprisoned in American concentration camps during World War II. These included Topaz Camp in Utah, Heart Mountain Camp in Wyoming, Gila River Camp in Arizona, Amachi Camp in Colorado, Crystal City Family Camp in Texas, Lordsburg Camp in New Mexico, and Tule Lake and Manzanar Camps in California. This particular journey to the Manzanar Camp transported the artists deeper into their family's roots to imagine a time when their relatives were sent to desolate areas of the country. The artists sought to dig deeper beneath the layers to reveal more about this unjust history that connected them as they discovered unexpected insights and unique shared experiences. is entitled Scarred, dedicated to my grandmother who was a floral artist. The focal point is the civilian exclusion poster that notified Japanese descendants to pack up and report to designated locations. It stands in my grandmother's antique vase that she used for creating her beautiful flower arrangements. But instead of water, the poster rises out of a pile of sand. I cut out the words, I am an American, in ironic contrast to the vase which symbolizes harmony and grace in the art of Japanese flower arranging. I am an American. One of the 
projects that we did together as a collaboration was to create lanterns using the images of our families, writing, drawing, and painting. Flickering candlelight bring memories honoring to our ancestors. Detained alien enemy glass kimono honors the prisoners of Japanese ancestry who were unjustly incarcerated during World War II in American concentration camps. I collected personal photographs of families, friends, and acquaintances which were taken while they were in the camps. I made a kimono out of glass hand cutting over 2,000 pieces and fusing them into 224 frames. I designed this life-size kimono to be worn. Even a slight movement causes the glass frames to strike against one another, creating the sound of wind chimes. I discovered that during the Obon festival in Japan, the ancestors are often called back using the sound of wind chimes. <laughs> This piece, entitled Transient Rooms, started with a photo of my mother and close friend of the family as young girls in front of the family's Sacramento boarding house in the late 1920s. As I added imagery of family mementos and experiences, the artwork came to tell the story of my family's continuing adaptation from farming to the nursery business to incarceration during World War II and then starting over again. The other piece, Barbed Wire Reflection, was created during an artist residency in Southern Oregon near Tule Lake. While there, I experienced a bit of the area's harsh winter weather which made me reflect on and appreciate the hardships that my family experienced while imprisoned at Tule Lake. The Remembrance Shrine is an interactive piece that I want people to explore and learn from. It is fashioned from a birdcage wrapped in rice paper and is like a small Buddhist home shrine and signifies the dignity and resilience of the imprisoned. I collected the memories and stories of those who are incarcerated or those of ancestors and I felt very honored to have those memories put into my trust and I was able to reveal them in an art piece that people could interact with. The memories of those who were incarcerated are hidden behind the shutters to reveal writings about this challenging time. This is so amazing. Wow. And then genius, this is yours? Yeah. And some have left their own written thoughts tied on the bottom of the shrine.